This is the continuation of Module 7. This is Part 2. Uh, in Part 1, we looked at documenting Daisy Lab, averaging data, and separating data. In Part 2, I'll introduce multiplexing data, the new SmartMux feature in Daisy Lab 2020 Service Pack 1, and the signal router and signal switch. Now let's talk about multiplexing data. Multiplexing allows you to take multiple data channels and combine it into one. Uh, we made a huge change in Daisy Lab 2020 Service Pack 1. It simplifies the function so you don't have to track the number of channels that you multiplex and the channel names. Uh, SmartMux is the name of the feature. Um, we're going to do an example where we're going to combine two channels and we can use both SmartMux and the original um, multiplex by value or multiplex by um, block and be able to compare how the feature works. I set up a worksheet to be able to look at how data gets multiplexed. This is an example of a 24 channel worksheet where I've got data coming in from three different generators. Uh, this is intended to simulate devices. So three different devices that are acquiring data at the same sample rate. Right now, the sample rate is 10 samples per second because the generator modules default to the Daisy Lab time base. So you can see that when you open the generator, I'll open its properties. And when you click on the time base button, you can see the time base settings are the Daisy Lab time base. And then click OK and go to the measurement time bases, all settings, the Daisy Lab time base is configured at 10 samples per second with a block size of one. We'll be able to change that to, if we need to, to be able to see how this function works with uh, larger block sizes. Also in the generator, I named each channel uniquely. So it's the generator number, this is generator zero, and then the channel number uh, up to channel seven. So zero to seven. And in generator one, I did the same thing. It's generator one through seven, and then generator two through seven. First, I can't get all of these data channels into one write data module. So I only created one write data module. And then I created a separate recorder just to show you that the data is getting generated. So if I restore all the displays, you can see that I have each channel uniquely named. I'll click Start. And this is a custom string for the file name. I'm calling it no mux. And when I start, one of the things I did is on the first channel, I configured the amplitude to be plus or minus two. This is a rectangular waveform. And for generator zero, it's two. Generator one, it's three. And generator two is four. That's so that we're going to be able to tell the difference between the waveforms coming from each of the generators. So on the recorder, I'm just showing channel two, which is a sinusoidal waveform. And again, the amplitude is two, three, and four. So how do I get all these data channels into one file? Let me minimize everything. I am going to do that by using the feature called multiplex. I will do that by deleting all the input connections going into the right module and moving it out of the way. I'm going to leave the recorder here, so, but I need to disconnect its channels. So we have a recorder and a write module. In the data reduction group, the function is called multiplex demultiplex. And when you drag it out, you get to choose which mode. So we're going to combine them. That's multiplexing. And when it opens its properties, you get the classical blockwise, the classical per value. So for all the releases over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, the only two settings available in here were by block or by value. And in Daisy Lab 2020 Service Pack 1, we added the SmartMux feature. I'm going to talk about the classic feature first. I'm going to do this by block. Click OK. Uh, well, no. 
add channel. So I have seven channels. Click OK. I can connect that up to the output of the digital meter. And I'm lazy. Right click, copy, right click, paste, connect it up, right click, paste, and connect it up. And so I'm just moving them so that it looks neater to me. So I can look at the outputs in that recorder. So you're going to see what the multiplex feature looks like. Initially, we have a block size of one, so the data is going to be kind of scrambled looking. The next thing I need to do is configure the right data module. Open its properties. It only needs three inputs now, so I'm going to reduce the number of channels to three. In the classic mode of multiplexing, you must tell the right data module how you did it. In an ASCII worksheet or an ASCII data file, um, a DNM DAT data file, or an IEEE 32-bit, you have to tell Daisy Lab how the data was multiplexed. In the Daisy Lab format and the NITDM format, you do not. Um, Daisy Lab determines it from the data, or in the case of Daisy Lab, it just stores the multiplex data. In a CSV file or a text file, you want Daisy Lab to correctly take the incoming data and put it in all the channels that it was. So if you've got eight channels coming in as one channel, you want the write module to write eight columns of data. Click on Options next to the word ASCII. And at the bottom half of this dialog box, there is the type of input data, single values, it now includes smart mucks, and we did mixed blocks. So you have to tell Daisy Lab what the incoming wires look like for each incoming wire. They do not have to be identical. You can have only one channel on an incoming wire, or you can have up to 16 channels, and each of them can be different. I did it symmetrically just because that's how I tend to think. Um, but this is going to be, you get to tell Daisy Lab how you did it. So for channel zero, I have eight channels. Now I have to click the plus sign on the input line. For channel one, I have eight channels. And then on channel two, I have eight channels. So at the bottom, I should be able to verify that I have a total of 24 channels eight coming in on each one of the inputs. If you do not do this, Daisy Lab will get confused and complain. Click OK. Click OK. I'm using the custom folder and name setup that we had used in previous worksheets. And now I'm going to connect these up. I can't do Kiss and Connect now, but it's only three channels, so it's pretty easy to do. And then I'm going to take a second and tidy this up because that's what I do. Uh, this already wants to move over. So I've got plenty of space to work with. So all I'm doing is just tidying it up a little so you can see where the wires come from and where they're going. All right. So now I've got three multiplex channels going into both the recorder and the right data module. The original data, just to remind you, when I look at the generator, channel 0 is a rectangle, channel 1 is a sine, channel 2 is a triangle, channel 3 is a sawtooth, and then it repeats rectangle, sine, triangle, and sawtooth. And the difference between them is going to be the frequency. So it's a little bit faster on the second four than it is on the first four. And it's the same for all three generator modules. All right, if I click Start, uh, this is going to be MUX by block. And click Start and restore the displays. Now the chart recorder is showing you 
very garbled display. Let's zoom in and you can see that it's garbled. Part of the reason that it's garbled is because each one of those signals is getting combined. So I'm getting a value from channel zero, a value from channel one, a value from channel two, and so on. It's much more visible if I increase the block size so that we have a larger block size of data. Uh, there are two ways to do it, and I'm going to do the easy way right now. Click Stop. The easy way is to go into the time-based setup and change the block size for the Daisy Lab time base, not the sampling rate, just the block size. And let's see how this looks when I do that. So I'm muxing by block again. And so now I'm getting 10 samples of each one of the waveforms. Um, and I'm getting eight of them and then restarting it. Uh, we can make it clearer and clearer by increasing the sample rate and then the block size and this should actually be pretty similar but um, again we've got a piece of a rectangular waveform a piece of a sine wave uh, let's stop the measurement so i can look at that zoom out a little um, zoom in So I've got a piece of a rectangular waveform, a piece of a sawtooth or a sine wave, the triangular, the sawtooth, the rectangular sine wave. Um, a little bit easier to see the sine wave as we zoom in. Um, so we're seeing these all combined in to one channel. So you get a little bit of each one of the channels and they're all combined into individual blocks. It is clearer to see it if I use a YT chart instead of a chart recorder. Now this is just to help you visualize what's happening. Um, not that this is the right way to look at it. So on the YT chart, if I look at the data, then you can see this is what a block of data looks like. So it's combining the data by block. As the amplitude increases and decreases, you're seeing different segments of the same signal. OK, so what did that do to the file? Let's look at the files. So I am doing these files, the 2020-1230 the MUX by block. So this is MUX as opposed to no MUX in the previous one. And I'm going to look at this with Excel. All right, when I open up the file, I am going to make the columns larger so that you can see the channel names. The channel names on each column start with the first channel name, generator 00. And then Daisy Lab indicates which channel in the group it is. It's slash zero, slash one, slash two, slash three, slash four, five, six, seven, and then generator one, slash zero. One of the reasons that I use the standard rectangular, sinusoidal, triangular, and sawtooth waveform is so that you can see clearly the data separated correctly. It was all merged in when we looked at it in the recorder, but when it comes out into the file, you've got generator zero is two, um, it's a slow waveform, negative two, uh, and so on. So uh, you can clearly see a little bit more visually that the data has been separated into the Excel file. So one of the limitations of the traditional mode is that Daisy Lab lost your original channel name. It only kept the channel name of channel zero. Turns out it also lost the individual units. Because I left everything as volts, it really didn't matter. But if you were combining some temperature, some pressure, um, and other types of, of channels into one file, you would have lost that context going into the file. 
So this is an example of what a MUX data file looks like when you MUX by block. If you MUX by value, you'll get the same information in the file. It's just what it looks like in Daisy Lab is going to be different. If you use the MUX feature to MUX by value, and you have a fairly high sample rate and a large block size, this can be very uh, time consuming. It, it makes Daisy Lab do a lot of work. If you get Daisy Lab to do it by block, it's actually much less work for Daisy Lab. So, what I want to do next is change this to Smart Mux and let you see the difference. So, I will go into each one of these modules and click Smart Mux. Click OK, minimize that, and change it to Smart Mux. And then to be able to illustrate this a bit more clearly, I'm going to change the units. Uh, let's do degrees C and then degrees F. And what can we do here? Let's do kilos. Um, we can do newtons. So that's enough to give you an idea so that in the first generator, we have got different units on several of the channels and we've left the others as volts. Now we've multiplexed by smart mux. We've got to go back and tell the right data module how to handle this. So in the ASCII options, I'm changing the type of input to single values smart mux. You don't have to tell Daisy Lab anything now. This is such a great new feature that I wish I didn't have to teach you the old way because the new way just works. It works the way you might think it probably should have worked all along. So am I excited about this new feature? Yeah, I think I am. All right, so I've got all this and I am going to restore the displays. I will click Start. I am going to Smart Mux. And Start. So now the display doesn't look any different. The displays still show you the same block that contains a bunch of different blocks. The displays on the screen, the, the digital meters don't change at all. What's going to change is in the data file. So click Stop. Look at the data file. So now we have a SmartMux data file. And I'm going to open it. And now let's select all these columns and let them auto size. Now I have generator 00, that's the original name. Units were volts. Now I have generator 01, the original name. Units are degrees C. Generator 2, degrees F. Generator 3, generator 4, generator 5. So it has remembered the channel name correctly and it has kept track of the units. And you're going to see all the way out to generator 2, number 7. Uh, let's get over there. There's generator to number seven. It has correctly mem remembered the channel name. And I didn't have to tell the right module what to do. Uh, let's save this. No, we don't save this. Uh, close that one. We don't need it. All right. So um, SmartMux is, is very clever, and it's even more clever um, than I am indicating. I am going to disconnect all the inputs into the right module. I'm going to make another multiplex module. I am going to multiplex three channels into one. So now I am combining eight multiplex channels into So take each group of three. Let's clean this up. And I'm going to change the right module to only have one input channel. I don't have to make any other changes. I don't have to tell Daisy Lab I did that in the right module. 
So now I'll connect up the right module. So now I have 24 double multiplex channels. They were multiplexed by 8, and then they were multiplexed by 3. Click Start. Let this run for a second. I'll click Stop. Now let's look at the new file. And the new file has correctly demultiplexed those channels. Let's make them all big. So it's done the same thing. It's got the correct channel name, the correct data. It's got the correct units for the channels where I changed units. And I had one wire to work with. So it got much neater working with this function. So why are you going to use multiplex? Let's go back and think about that for a second. You're going to use multiplex any time you need to store more than 16 channels into a write module. And with the new Smart Mux feature, let me keep advertising this, the new Smart Mux feature is going to allow you to store a very large number of channels into a file. You may actually run out of room in Excel before you're going to run out of room in Daisy Lab. The traditional multiplex feature maxes out at 256 channels. So you could only store 256 channels into one file. Now, unless you think that this is an arbitrary thing or, or doesn't apply in the real world, we do have Daisy Lab customers who are acquiring large number of channels. And there's at least one worksheet that's got about 400 temperature channels. And in order to work with Daisy Lab 2020 in the first release, they had to create two data files and multiplex the data to be able to combine into two different files. With Daisy Lab 2020 Service Pack 1, they can now write all of their data into a single file. And that's going to make it much easier for them to work with the resultant data. We'll take a quick look at the signal switch and signal router modules. Uh, they allow you to control multiple channels in two different ways. The signal switch allows you to have multiple inputs and the settings of the module determine which of those inputs will be routed to the output. The signal router takes a single input and routes it to one of the many outputs and only one of the outputs has live data on it at a time. I'll start by looking at the signal router. First, I'll create a quick worksheet with a measurement computing analog input. And I've got my function generator generating data for channel zero. To show you how to use the signal router, first we have to create it. So go to the control group and select signal router. It's in the bottom half of the list and drag it out. You have a choice of amplitude controlled or time controlled. I'll set it up initially with time controlled. And you can have a number of outputs. And the time control specifies um, which output channel is going to receive the input data and how frequently. So this is set up for every five blocks. Uh, if I do this with multiple channels, so let's say I do this for one block, the channel two for two blocks, channel three for three blocks, four blocks, and five blocks. So um, I'll have an increasing number, and I will repeat the cycle at the end. You can also use seconds, minutes, or hours. The configuration is per channel. So everything underneath the channel bar specifies the specific channel. 
because it's changing the file name, um, it defaults to having the channel name selected where you can type in the channel name. I'm going to disable that on all the channels. And I'm going to click the F7 key so we can see how this works. It should still copy the unit through regardless. So the signal router has a single input. I'll connect my USB 201 to it. And then to be able to look at this, to visualize what's going to happen, I'm just going to look at it in a chart recorder. The chart recorder is flexible because it allows you to mix channels. Um, so I've got four channels, zero to four, configured. And it doesn't care whether the inputs are all synchronized in time. What we should see on the chart recorder is the data moving from the first trace to the second trace to the third trace and then repeating. We are sampling data at 1,000 samples per second with a block size of 100. So five blocks will be half a second. So click Start. Let's see how this looks. So you can see this is very quickly skipping the channels. So it's giving you a block from channel 0, two blocks, three blocks, four blocks, five blocks. So an increasing number of blocks per channel, and then it's rotating back again to start again at channel 0. So only one channel is getting data at a time. So when the signal router is outputting channel 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 are not getting any data. And the chart recorder shows that very visually because there's no data there. There isn't even a line to connect them because we didn't configure the chart recorder to connect the lines. So that's what the signal router can do. What it can do is allow you, based on time, to switch to different parts of your process, different computations, different outputs. It depends on how you want to configure it. The other way to use the module is to configure it to use an input to determine which output is energized. So I'll delete the signal router module, and I'll put it back in again. Because this was modal, you can't simply go into the dialog box and change it. You have to remove it and put it back in again. When you select the module type here, uh, it is different than the uh, time controlled because it gives you a choice of how you want to handle the channel changes. Do you want to use an edge on increment, a rising edge, a falling edge, or do you want to use a data channel? And I'm going to use a data channel for the input. Uh, we've got the five channels, 0 to 4. Click OK. I'll connect the recorder up. I'll connect the data up. And then I need to add a control to go into the gold X. I will use a slider module. And the slider module will have one output. It will go from 0 to 4. So when it's 0, the router will output on channel 0. When it's 4, it will output on channel 4. I need a resolution of 4 to match that. Uh, the scale will set itself up correctly. Click OK. I always want to start at 0 when I hit Start. So those are the settings. I'll wire it up. Let's look at the switch bring it into the worksheet. So I've got a switch that's labeled 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 to match up with the input channels. And what should happen then when I hit start is that it will use the value coming out of the slider to determine which channel is moved to the recorder. Ah, so the first thing we get is you can't connect these channels. Sample rate or block size do not match. Well, that's true. Um, by default, generator modules default to the DAISY Lab time base, and the analog input is at the measurement computing time base. There are two ways to fix this. You open the properties to the slider, you click on options. You could quickly select the time base that you're using, or you can select with input. 
with input allows you to connect to a channel that's going into the same module that complained. So the signal router, I'll branch the data going into block or channel zero into the zero input of the slider. And the slider will use that input channel for timing only, not for the data, just to pick up the timing. Now when I click start, I should not see an error message. And I've got data coming out on channel zero. I've got data coming out on channel four. I'll move the slider to two. I've got data coming out on channel two, channel three, channel one, channel three. Now, one thing you notice is that as I moved the slider, another channel got energized as I went through it. Now, if you want to be much more precise and have an output that is very clearly the value, uh, there are two ways to do it. I'm going to use a coded switch. So click stop. I'll replace the slider with a coded switch from the control group. The coded switch looks like buttons, and they're labeled 0, 1, and so on. If I open its properties, I need to add switch positions. So I have got five switch positions. Each switch position will output a different value by default. Switch position one outputs zero, and switch position five outputs four. Uh, you can set this up to have unique names. And you can also, if we just leave it the default, change the number of decimals. So I'm going to put zero. Click OK. So now I've got a button bar that's got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm more persnickety than that. I'm going to change it so that I have one switch division. So I've got a stack of numbers. Click OK. Click OK. So now I've got a stack of numbers. Click Start. Now I'm on channel 0. Now when I click channel 3, it doesn't go through 1 and 2 to get there. When I click on one, it doesn't go through two to click there. So it is much cleaner if you use something like the coded switch to be able to control the input to the signal router. I like the coded switch module because it also gives you the ability to have a rotary switch. And so now I've got a rotary switch that I can easily click around. And again, it's clean. Even though it looked like I went through two and three, it didn't switch to them on the way to get to the next number. So that's an example of how to use the signal router. The signal router, only one output of modules energized. And the, uh, the input controlled signal router, the one that has the control input, uses the input to determine which channel is output. If the number is out of range, if the number, say, is 10, it will just go to its largest number. It'll go to 4, and it will stay there. If the number is below 0, it will go to 0, and it will stay there. To look at the signal switch module, I want to get rid of this worksheet. I'll save it first. File save as, and this was the signal router. And file new to clear it. In order to give us some unique inputs to be able to work with the signal switch module, I'm going to use a generator. But first, let's find the signal switch module. It's in data reduction. Drag out signal switch. It's next to the last. Drop it. Like the signal router, you have a choice between amplitude controlled and time controlled. Uh, let's jump straight to amplitude controlled. Click OK. Same kind of controls where we've got edge controlled increment or decrement, or you can have the input channel specify the data channel. I will create four inputs for this module, and it will only have one output. So it's got four data inputs, 
a control input and one output. The control input is going to determine which of these uh, data inputs are routed to the output of the signal. In order to make this be really visual, I want to create a generator module from the control group. And I'm going to do it without modulation. I want four input channels. By default, the generator will create a rectangle, a sine wave, a triangle, and a sawtooth. So this is really convenient for this type of example. It gives you four unique signals that are easy to tell apart, and you'll be able to tell which one of them is being routed to the output. I want to use a slider to control the input. Uh, the slider is going to be the controller. It will go from 0 to 3. It will have a resolution of 3. I'll have a start value of 0, so it will always start at 0. Click OK. Let's look at the slider. So we've got a slider that's got a 0 to 3 resolution. It'll go to 1. It'll go to 2. It'll go to 3. The scale isn't labeled quite right. So if I go to scale and select automatic scaling, Daisy Lab should be a bit smarter about labeling the numbers. I will connect the slider output to the input of the signal switch. And I'll do the same thing that I did with the previous example and create a chart recorder. And I only need one channel. Click OK. And restore the chart record. Rearrange. And click Start. So the first thing that I'm seeing coming out of signal switch is a rectangular waveform. That is channel 0 of the generator. If I move the control to channel 1, it will switch over to the sine wave wherever it was in its signal. Switch to 2, it will do the same thing. It will go this time to the triangular waveform. And then it will, when I move to 3, go to the sawtooth waveform. If you prefer the coded switch kind of control, I'll click Stop, remove the slider, drop in a coded switch instead. So this is just to remind you there are multiple ways to do this. I need four positions because I have four channels. They're going to be labeled with the position. I don't need decimals. I liked the rotary switch. So we'll just move to that right away, wire it up, and restore it, make it big enough to work with, and click Start. And again, I can move the switch and go to position 3. You immediately go to that uh, sawtooth waveform, get a cycle of it, switch back to triangular waveform, back to the sine waveform, and the rectangular waveform. So the signal switch is allowing you to pick which of your inputs you're going to output. To review module 7, document, document, document. Oh, and back it up. We looked at averaging, separating to reduce data, as well as to do the average computation. We looked at multiplex to manage complexity and a high channel count. And we reviewed the signal switch and signal router modules for techniques to manage data flow. In module 8, we'll do some advanced data file topics, the black box module, the action module, the message module, and program startup and shutdown.